nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. So first of all, thank you again for joining us today for our webinar, Interactive Modeling of Materials with Density Functional Theory Using the Quantum Espresso Interface Within the MIT Atomic Scale Modeling Toolkit. Our presenter today, Dr. Enrique Guerrero, has been a developer of this MIT Atomic Scale Modeling Toolkit since 2021, and he has an expertise in computational physics. So with that, I am going to hand it over to Dr. Guerrero. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, thank you all for, for coming from, from all over the world. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Um, yeah, so I, I've got a, a short introductory PowerPoint here, so don't worry, it's not just going to be me uh, talking to you for, for an hour. Uh, we're going to get to actually using the toolkit, and that's going to be the bulk of this, of this uh, presentation. So uh, I really highly recommend that, that you make a NanoHub account uh, using those links. Uh, and and we can we can sort of work through it together, um, and that will really benefit you. So, the the overview of what we're doing today is we're going to be using the the quantum espresso uh, DFT density functional theory application within uh, the MIT Atomic Scale Tool Modeling Toolkit. Um, and this is especially useful for you if you're trying to integrate this uh, application for classroom use. Um, and might be maybe more useful if you if you already know what what DFT is and what it brings to the table. Um, uh, but if, if you don't, that's okay. Uh, we can still uh, work uh, work through these through this worksheet. So this is a the second part of a two part series. Uh, the first was given by by my advisor uh, Professor David Struba, uh, and previously he talked about Cure uh, or course undergrad. Uh, graduate research experience, and the idea is that uh, we have undergraduates uh, doing research in the classroom on a, a new material, uh, and and this name Cure came from biologists who who may have been looking at many um, uh, solutions that that could have been a, you know a cure. It's sort of tongue in cheek. Um, so here's an example of of a student's work from from the class that he's he's taught. Um, he, he had students uh, work with uh, MOS2, molybdenum disulfide, uh, with selenium dopant uh, at various comp uh, concentrations. Um, it's so high, actually, that maybe it's also MOSE with, with sulfur dopant. Um, and the students use the, the dopant at different locations. And, that would be a lot for, say, one person to, to try and do every possible location. But if we split up the work amongst many students, um, for example, uh, then, then we can find out a lot of material properties uh, about a wide array of materials. So it's kind of a, a, a bit of a quantity, um, not over quality, but it, uh, it's, it's, it's really putting quantity in, into the, the picture um, and allows students to, to do, you know, high-level computations. The toolkit that we have been working on uh, really removes some of the overhead uh, required uh, for what you might do for, say, a grad student uh, if you're a PI. Um, for example, you don't need to teach Linux or Bash uh, if, if the student doesn't know it. Um, it's a graphical interface. Um, it's if you want to teach sort of some level of, of density functional theory uh, or maybe even no level of density functional theory, you just sort of treat it as a black box, that works as well. Uh, here's a, a few resources uh, for sort of introducing uh, to, to density functional theory, uh, especially for students. I, I find that a video such as this one is quite beginner friendly. Um, and these links will be, uh, this, this will be posted into the toolkit uh, webpage itself, and I'll show you how to access it as well, this, uh, this presentation, so you can access these links. Um, a few others, so there's the Nano uh, Hub DFT user group, which you can join if you're uh, highly interested in, in DFT, and perhaps you can ask people questions there if, if you run into a problem or, or you really don't know, um, they'll point you in the right direction. There's a lecture series actually done by NanoHub uh, like eight years ago. Uh, it's on YouTube. Um, this is the a book that I've seen recommended a lot uh, for, for intro to DFT. Um, 
And then uh, this paper is, is one that I've u I used for myself to, when I first learned DFT, and it helped me understand, especially about pseudo-potentials, um, really get a sense for what's happening. Um, but again, this, this uh, PBS one is beginner-friendly. Um, you know, it's built for a more general audience, and so it might be a good to give as an assignment for students to watch um, and then come back and, 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 uh, and work on the toolkit. Okay, so we're using Quantum Espresso, and we're doing DFT. Uh, these are sort of four uh, elements that go into, into what Quantum Espresso does, um, and on most of these just what DFT is in general. Um, without going into you know too much detail, the Schrodinger equation uh, is the sort of basis of everything here. Um, if we had, could solve the Schrodinger material, the Schrodinger equation for any material, we would know pretty much anything about that material that we would care about. Um, we we would know how its energy sort of responds to to different stimulations, um, and that surprisingly gets you to just about any property that you can think of in a material, uh, such as, you know, its elasticity uh, or its, you know, spectra, et cetera. Um, but it's difficult to solve, mainly because the electrons interact with one another, and that makes it a highly dimensional problem, and it, it's, uh, it's difficult. Um, the hohenberg cohn theorem, okay, uh, which is the basis of DFT in general, says that you only need the correct density and not necessarily uh, the correct wave functions to have uh, an accurate system representation um, to, to get the, the correct energy. You need the correct electron density. Um, Cohn Sham uses that uh, and takes it further and, and it sort of it makes up a system uh, with its new Cohn Sham wave functions um, that produce the same density but sort of has a different set of rules. Uh, it doesn't exactly follow the Schrodinger equation. It just looks like it. Um, and, and essentially what it does is it puts the electrons into a, a mean field. Um, and uh, this removes the the sort of electron. Uh, um, it, it hides the electron interaction in, into a, a sort of different uh, mathematical um, solution. So it, it becomes a solvable problem now. Uh, Quantum Espresso uses plane waves. Um, so it, it's a sort of natural uh, basis set for for cohn sham wave functions in, in sort of periodic systems, and so it's very good. Uh, it's it sort of naturally meshes with with materials physics, um, whereas chemists might use a different basis set like orbitals. Um, okay, and so the what we're going to do is we're going to look at silicon. Uh, it's sort of a, a favorite because it's it's so nice and simple, and it behaves very well um, and doesn't throw a lot of errors, even when we take our approximations to the limit. And so that's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to first get acquainted with the toolkit. Then we're going to find some, some ideal uh, computation parameters and compute density of states and band structure. And then uh, phonon frequencies and Raman intensities, if we have time, uh, we might do a little more. So uh, now I will tell you to go go to um, go to nanohub.org. Instructions are on the right here. It's on menu, um, you would have signed in. Uh, I've signed in here already, and I'll search for MIT Atomic Scale Toolkit. Yeah, and so here you can you can click on these tabs. Um, I will say we we don't have the best documentation uh, for this toolkit. I think it was sort of developed over time uh, by many different people, uh, and so I think this document that I've just uh, provided is is a good um, sort of introduction to the quantum espresso aspect of it. Um, and, and yeah, we'll we can work on. Uh, putting more uh, documents in here, but if you go to supporting docs, uh, the last three entries here, uh, the most recent one is this PowerPoint that I'm showing you, and these two here are uh, the guide that we're going to work off of. Okay, so, and here it is on the right. Here's the guide. I've put up a Word document in case you wanted to just sort of um, Copy or edit it yourself uh, for a classroom. You might say just cut out, you know, 
sections one through five, et cetera. Um, yeah, so uh, we we can go ahead and, and open up the toolkit. So on the same page, um, we'll launch the tool. And I'm going to keep uh, the tool on the left and the, uh, the document on the right. Um, I recommend that you follow along. Um, the way that this document is written is uh, it's just sort of prompts, tells you what to do, very specific where, where to input stuff. Um, for example, you'll see some pictures and, and these red boxes uh, tell you what, what each of these elements of the toolkit do. And whenever you see a green highlight, it, it's sort of telling you you should be typing right now, um, uh, that you should be entering something into the toolkit. Um, yeah, so again, this is sort of written uh, with the idea in mind that someone may put this into a course um, on, on its own. You know, this I wouldn't use this for research um, simply because it's not as fast as as a, a you know a supercomputer or what other uh, computing resources we might have, um, and you don't have as much control over Quantum Espresso. Um, so if you really, really want to learn uh, how to manipulate Quantum Espresso and, and bend it to your will, um, I wouldn't say this is the way to go. Maybe it's a, a way to start, um, but it would be a, a good way uh, sort of for pedagogy and for teaching and learning. Okay, so um, here, this toolkit is comprised of many uh, different pieces, right? And Quantum Espresso is only one uh, portion of it, but it's the one we're going to focus on. Um, so let's scroll down here. Uh, the many of these, uh, all, all of these actually would be useful in the same setting that I'm referring to. Um, Quantum Espresso does uh, density functional theory, and so go ahead and click on on the Quantum Espresso module in this uh, corner here. And just to point out, sort of the about this this toolkit here that the uh, uh, there are different pieces uh, for these NanoHub toolkits. First, here is where you select, you know, which little application within the toolkit you use. Um, uh, you're allowed to do three of these in three separate windows. So you see, I've got three separate windows here, all running the toolkit um, in your account. If you try and run a fourth one, you've sort of met your quota. You're using too many resources, okay? And if you're done with one, then you will have to terminate it before you can start another one. And so that's what this big X is for, okay? Um, we can't just have you using all of NanoHub's resources, right? So <laughs> um, keep for later. Uh, doesn't end your, your session. Uh, and, and so you can sort of save it and come back to it. Even if I close the tab, actually, I can come back, uh, open up NanoHub, and it'll say, hey, you had a session open, so so make sure to terminate your session uh, when you're done with it. Uh, this little refresh uh, button here uh, at the bottom uh, corner, bottom right corner, is uh, very helpful when the uh, system it gets stuck sometimes. Um, it happens, and so you click that refresh. Uh, and this guy here helps resize your window, which is very useful. As you can see, there's actually other stuff going on down here. Um, I've noticed sometimes actually this this bar here bugs out, uh, and all you have to do is is resize the window, and you can see all the other options. OK? So that's about the the, the um, interface, the over, over interface. Within the toolkit, OK, um, the sort of paradigm here is that we have two main tabs, these first two, and four sort of optional tabs. Um, and so uh, these, these tabs are, are, are good little markers that tell us um, where we should be, uh, you know, inputting things. In. And it might help you if you're in a class to sort of separate and say, um, you know, we don't have to worry about these three tabs if we're only interested in, in phonons or something. Or, um, you know, in, in this particular tab, don't worry about it. We're just, I'm just going to tell you what to put in. But in, in the physical system tab, um, you'll have to figure out what goes in, in which spot. Um, and that works well if, if, um, 
in here, calculation, your students don't know anything about DFT, you can just tell them what to put in. In the physical system, if you're teaching materials physics, uh, you might want them to figure out, you know, what to put in for a stint or for, for the brevet lattice. Okay. Um, so what do these tabs do? Uh, the physical system is uh, telling you, you know, what's the computation type uh, um, and, and what's, what's happening in the, with the, the, the main physics of our system um, and the geometry. Right. Whereas calculation parameters is telling you more specifically, you know, what are the approximations that are going into DFT, um, uh, and what what properties are going into DFT? Looping. Uh, we'll see a little bit about looping. It's it allows you to do many computations. So here I've I've enabled it just to show you. Um, in in which you can you can change one variable. Uh, for example, lattice cell factor, uh, we can ch change the size of the cell a little bit, um, and it does that automatically. Okay, density of states is DOS, um, and, and uh, what features go in, band structure for the electronic band structure, and then phonons um, for a whole host of stuff, including Raman, uh, Raman and IR. And then phonon band structures and phonon density of states. Um, that's the most recent sort of uh, addition that we've been working on uh, last year. Okay, so um, whenever you set your parameters, uh, we click simulate. So why don't I just go ahead and click simulate? Um, just with the default parameters, I, I think it's got uh, carbon right now. Um, yeah, and so you might notice. Uh, if you've done it, uh, if you've simulated yourself, so that here uh, we've switched from the input phase into the simulate phase. Um, and so it looked like it did some work uh, and it finished. And now we have a whole host of output files, um, four of them. And there's a lot of stuff uh, going on here, right? So here we can actually download these files. Um, and uh, or, or we can do it from this bar here and we can switch between all of these output files um, and some of these are just jargon right now uh, but I'll sort of go over them as we try an actual uh, simulation here um, and when you're done you just go back uh, to the input this way um, you can also come back to the simulation and, and it's fine but if you change any of these parameters uh, once you go back to the simulate, it re-simulates um, with the new parameters. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started uh, with the sort of first thing that you do in a in a DFT computation, uh, and that is um, to to figure out what approximation uh, levels you're doing. Right. So um, I'm going to clear the simulation here. This is going to clear all the output, um, and we're going to start over. Um, in the input. Um, so, first, uh, we're going to turn on visual, visualize, visualize in, in uh, XCristen. Okay, so XCristen is a program that just lets you see the, the atoms. Okay, we're going to turn that on. Um, and I'm going to do silicon, and right now it's got carbon. Uh, so, we've got to change this lattice constant. Uh, it's something like 5.47. Um, and these are going to be uh, silicon. Um, you know, and this value 5.47 can come from a book, um, but I've also written some instructions on how you could get there through the materials project. Um, I'm not sure what it's asking for there, but yeah, so there's a materials project, um, and it's uh, like NanoHub in some ways. You can, you know, make a free account and sign in, um, but uh, they do many things there. Uh, the main thing is is that they they do a lot of of computations on just sort of a wide array array of materials, and so you can sort of look up silicon. Um, and this first one is the low energy ones, low formation energy. Um, and here, some of the properties that they tell you 
are the crystal structure. And that's where I got this value 5.47. Uh, but these are actually dependent on uh, many of, of your calculations properties, uh, such as, you know, is your wave function cut off, uh, you know, low enough or um, are you using enough uh, K points, right? So, um, yeah, I've changed uh, the atoms and the lattice constant. Uh, and we're going to keep it everything else the same. It is uh, face center cubic. Um, and so we're going to go to uh, calculation parameters. And we are going to change the XC functional, uh, which is sort of the, the main approximating bit <laughs> within, within DFT. Um, and we're going to change that to GGA. Um, we know that the GGA bond lengths tend to be a little bit better uh, than, than the LDA, so we're just going to use that one for now. Um, okay, and then we're going to go to looping and enable looping. Um, so we're going to do a wave function kinetic energy cutoff study. So uh, the idea here is there's a value um, here in calculation parameters called the the wave function cutoff, um, and this tells you a, a ascent, what it what it amounts to is how many plane waves are you going to use as your basis set. You know we can't actually use an infinite basis set of um, with computers, they have a finite amount of memory. So we use a finite uh, number and, um, and this, this value here, uh, the larger it is, the more uh, plane, wave, uh, plane waves you, you include. And so we're going to go to looping, select wave function kinetic energy cutoff. Uh, we'll start at 15 and go to 60, just like the picture on the right. Uh, in in 10 steps, um, so I think that's steps of 5, 15, 20, 25, 30, so on. Um, and we're going to look at the, the total energy. Uh, yeah, and, and so we'll go ahead and hit simulate. And so this will do the entire... Uh, simulate? This will do the entire uh, study uh, automatically. Um, and so in DFT computations, this is one of the first things, uh, if not the first thing you sort of will do, um, because uh, your your um, research is really only as accurate as your approximations, um, and not using an infinite basis set is an approximation, right? So let's give it a little moment. It's doing them one by one. Uh, after it's done looping, it's going to go back and do the very first um, uh, the one that had a, the default 30 uh, value. Okay, so it's done now. Uh, you get this weird uh, picture that comes from um, X Chris Den. Uh, we could just ignore this one uh, for now. Um, it, it's sort of just logging some, some information. Uh, and here is A0. Uh, again, it's X Chris Den. Um, don't give it too much attention. Let's just press OK. Uh, and continue, and it gives us our structure here. Okay. Um, so, X is is a you know its own beast uh, that you can sort of learn and and really sort of understand and manipulate. But one thing that I will tell you uh, is down here we have some stuff that might be useful in a classroom. For example, distance. Um, it, it opens new tabs. Uh, like uh, which would be a new window, I guess, if you were using this uh, locally. Um, but once I've clicked that, I can select two atoms, and then go back to the distance tab. Um, and yes, I wanted an angstrom. Next, um, oops, I think I had this too. Accidentally press next. Yeah. Um, so here you can see the the positions of the atoms, um, and you can surmise the distance. Or you press done. Uh, not next, <laughs> and it uh, it tells you what the distance between two atoms is, two point three seven, apparently. Um, yeah, so so this is a very very useful visualization tool uh, that goes along with with the toolkit. Um, we'll close it for now. 
Uh, and we might come back to it if we get to phonons. Uh, but if you look, this is a nice picture if you're familiar with, with you know, uh, cutoffs. And again, this is why we chose silicon is it's, it's so nice, even, even down to 15 uh, Rydbergs, which is really, really quite low. <laughs> um, and so this is like a, a stereotypical cutoff plot. It has a nice sort of exponential looking shape. The idea is the higher this value, um, the more accurate your, your computation, right? But it also takes up a lot more resources to go, to go up really high. Um, on the y-axis, we've got the energy. And typically, you would subtract the energy from the, the, the largest value. And we sort of pretend that this 60 is infinite. Um, you might you know, do 120 Rydbergs or something. But I don't want it to take forever for this, uh, for this meeting here. Um, and in this curve, you pick a good value sort of within this bend that compromises between accuracy and speed. Um, for our purposes, I'm going to pick 25. Um, it, it's got about um, 0 0.01 EV per atom difference. Um, I forget what, it's like 0 0.001 Rydberg. <laughs> um, it's, it, there's always sort of rough values. People have different ideas of what's a good number to choose as the difference between this energy and the final energy. Um, but it, it will always sort of lie within this bend. Um, yeah, so, so that, that's a, a successful uh, kinetic energy cutoff. Um, and there's other stuff in this plot that we can look at. For example, uh, suppose we wanted to uh, evalu evaluate this further with Python or Excel or something external. Uh, we can look at the value table which gives you what the parameters are, or, or what the values are, um, some of these values uh, across the looping, um, across the different uh, energy cutoffs. Um, and, and so you can take this value, this, this page here, and sort of download it, um, and, and maybe uh, put it into Excel that way, you know, save as. Um, so I'm going to pause here for, uh, for questions. Um, yeah, great. We did have a few questions come in. Okay. Um, the most recent being maybe relevant to what you were just speaking about. What parameters improve the approximation? Uh, right. So, um, yeah, let's go back to the input. Uh, improve the approximation as in make it slower but, but better, uh, but more accurate. Um, in this page here, uh, we've got the wave function kinetic energy cutoff, the larger that is, um, as I've said, yeah, the larger that is, the, the slower, um, um, but the more uh, plane waves we include in the basis set, so it makes it more accurate. Um, the K-grid is a, a sort of feature of the fact that we're doing things in reciprocal space, um, uh, which is sort of natural with, with uh, uh, thinking of materials as, as sort of being an infinite system. Um, the larger this value is, the more points in the Bruyne space we are uh, sampling, uh, and so the more accurate our sort of integrals are. Okay, so uh, typically, um, if you have a small system as we do here, we have a you know it's only five angstroms across. Um, this typically the the smaller it is physically, the larger K grid you need for accuracy. Um, so I wouldn't publish something with, with a four by four K grid for something this small. Uh, it might have to go much larger, um, like 12 by 12 or something for most properties. Um, but you can do the same thing. We don't have a looping enabled for K grid, uh, but I guess we could, we could try something like that. Um, you could do it manually, do one, one by one. And, and that might be, uh, what you might have students do, uh, is increase these values, uh, these little force here. Um, uh, GGA is for for most things that I know of superior to LDA, uh, or it's more physically accurate. Um, and I think that is it for this page. Uh, for other stuff, um, you know, for example, band structure. Uh, well, yeah, band structure. I guess uh, you can increase this just to increase the, well, 
Yeah, no, for both for for this this stuff, it's uh, you know, okay, there we go, DOS. Um, again, more K points. So mainly in this tool, it's the K points and the the uh, kinetic energy cutoff. Okay. Um, as an experimentalist, can we use quantum espresso as a tool? Um, I would say you definitely, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, biologists use uh, quantum espresso, for example, and they use DFT tools. Um, it, it's sort of a, a a beast of of how comfortable are you with you know using um using uh, DF, uh, just computer tools uh, of something where you, you kind of treat it a little bit more of a black box than, than a computational or a theoretical physicist uh, might. Um, but I would say you might need somebody to guide you uh, to use quantum espresso as an experimentalist. Um, but yeah, this tool is, is quite basic. I think any experimentalist should, uh, should be able to use it um, so long as you're sort of told uh, what some of this this stuff here means, um, everything on this page should be understandable to you. Uh, what is the difference between quantum espresso and siesta? Okay, so um, I don't want to confuse this one. I I I thought siesta is not DFT. Um, okay, so it is. Uh, I am perhaps confusing it, but I don't know if they use a plane wave basis set. Uh, strictly localized basis sets sounds like the opposite of plane wave um, basis set, which are extended. Okay, so siesta is, sounds to me like it's it's more um, naturally fit for molecules than it is for, for extended systems. Um, you can do molecules in espresso, and the way we do that is we sort of go into a box and we just, we set this to like 20 or something. Uh, and now we have two silicon atoms with a bunch of empty space around them. Um, but it's still repeating, so there's another two atoms here, but they're so far that there's no interaction. So I think I w that's a pretty big difference is just the basis set that they use. They they have a different set of like um, approximations that are so sort of auxiliary, but but um, but yeah. Uh, difference between Monkhorst and Gamma. Okay, so Monkhorst uh, is a, a scheme for choosing what K points or what points in the brilliant space. Um, Gamma is sort of saying we're only going to choose the one point, um, and it's useful sometimes, um, depending on what you're doing, to only do, uh, you know, k equals zero zero zero, um, whereas uh, Monkhorst uses many points um, to get a, a more accurate sample. Sometimes you all are only interested in what, what's happening in gamma. Um, what parameters improve the convergences of complex systems? Uh, such as a, a big cluster. Um, yeah, so that's a that's a tough question. Uh, it's very sort of dependent on the system, right? Um, always, always, if you're using espresso, is there's these two points, right? Um, but in something so complex, there might be other things to to worry about, uh, such as magnetism, um, which uh, I I don't think we've we've added here. No, so yeah, you have to go to to espresso directly. Um, uh, but but yeah, it's very system dependent. Um, perhaps it, there are better tools than 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 espresso like Siesta for for your particular cluster. Um, if not, then then yeah, it's it's pretty much about uh, ramping up some of these parameters <laughs> uh, and dealing with the the longer time. I mean, um, complex systems can just take. A, long time with DFT. Um, can we change the brilliant zone and try the the following zone two or three rather than the first one? Ah, so uh, that is a good point. Yeah, so um, I didn't think about that. But you know what? That that would be that would be nice. So um, let's let's go ahead and just as a, as a teaching moment. Not sure how much time we have? With Twenty minutes. Um, yeah. Okay. We could still do that. Um, silicon. And 
just take a, a good little picture of the brillion zone. Um, yeah, as a good experiment, you might say follow a specific path. Um, or you might choose K points in a very specific location in this uh, in this uh, Brion zone. Um, yeah, so I, we don't have that implemented, but but that might be a, a good idea, um, a, a really good teaching tool. Um, but what you can do is go into the band structure and follow a specific path down to Brion zone. So similar, um, but it might be might be useful to sort of pick a very specific K point. Um, how important are, are K points? Yeah, they're, they're very important. <laughs> they tell you about how, how accurate your, um, your integrals are. Um, but you can always ramp this number quite high. Uh, you know, 10 by 10 by 10 is probably good enough for a system this small for, um, for most things that you would do using this tool. Um, but it will take longer. Uh, and finally, what's the pseudo potential? Uh, so this is a norm conserving uh, pseudo potential, I, I believe. Um, the, the SG15, um, and I think we should go back, um, go back to the to the worksheet uh, in, in the interest of time. Um, so yeah, the, those are ONCV norm conserving pseudo potentials um, that we've got installed. We, you know, could in theory just keep adding other ones, but um, we just kept it simple. Okay, great. So, so these were very good questions. I hope they they helped. Um, yeah. So, so in the interest of time, so I had a whole section on the Young's modulus. Um, it's not really the Young's modulus the way that it's uh, presented here because uh, we're looping across um, the um, the lattice parameter, which is the sort of triaxial strain. Um, so, if you wanted to do this truly. Uh, you might have to do sort of individual co computations, which um, we wanted to implement, but uh, it turns out it's a little bit more uh, difficult um, than what we did here. Um, and what the idea is is in and in Young's modulus is you you sort of uh, apply strain to your system, you increase the size of the cell, you take computations along the way, um, and so you have strain is what you input. We have as part of our output stress, um, and there's like a sort of Hooke's law relationship, uh, like relationship between the stress and the strain, um, with the spring constant in between, and that's what the Young's modulus is. Um, but we'll skip that, except um, except for actually, let's do one thing, which is we're gonna just do the first part, which is the the VC relax. Okay, so. Um, we're going to change our calculation mode um, from SCF to VC relax. Okay, and for all of these things here, if you don't know what they mean, hold your mouse over it, and there's a little blurb. Okay, um, and I've I've uh, just recently been working on improving these these uh, these little blurbs, um, and so that should be in a recent in an update that's upcoming. Um, so here, VC Relax, it says geometric optimization of atomic positions and lattice vectors. So the difference between SCF and VC Relax is SCF, we just sort of, we tell it, this is the system, take the energy of the system, give me what, what's the energy and other properties like uh, stress. VC Relax is saying, take my system and change the atomic positions and change the lattice vectors such that they lower the energy. Okay, and so um, then we'll end up with a more accurate um, uh, uh, ge geometry. Okay, so we're going to keep this 5.47, but we'll see that we're, we're going to improve that value. Um, let's see, so that's all fine. So we decided that based on our picture, 25 Rydbergs was probably fine uh, as our wave function kinetic energy cutoff. Um, we're going to make sure that looping is off now. We don't want to worry about it. Uh, we're not going to loop across the, the wave functions. Uh, turn this off since I, actually, since I turned it on just to, to show you earlier. And let's go ahead and simulate. Okay. Uh, really, let me take a look at another question. Um, it's the bulk modulus, though. Um, 
maybe. <laughs> uh, I have to look at the equations. It's been a, a good moment. Oh, oh, you're right. Yes, you're right. Uh, yes, it's uh, that's right. Yes, so I could just change Young's for bulk modulus. Um, how do you view the calculated band structure and DOS? Uh, right, so um, that's in the next phase. Uh, what we have to do is we will go into band structure and turn this on and then mess with some of these parameters. Okay, for now, uh, we'll keep it off. How do you view the, okay. Can we simulate super lattices? Uh, that's, uh, that might be a little bit more complex. Um, or MQW, I'm not sure what you mean by MQWs. I'm, I'm thinking by super lattice, you mean something like a twisted uh, bilayer. Uh, some live learning here. Uh, mul okay, multiple quantum wells. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that's the answer. <laughs> okay, so uh, it's done simulating here. Um, if we see all these files, like this file is the energy cutoff loop, it still exists, but it's blank, right? And that's because we've done a new simulation. And this is a neat thing about, about this Rapture system that, that this toolkit uses. We can jump back to the first simulation and say, compare it to a second simulation. Um, and so I would highly recommend you sort of uh, play around with that, with that idea um, it, with some of these loop plots um, if, if you're interested. It does have this sort of drawback that sometimes you have some simulations which, you know, oh, this one didn't work. You might have to clear it um, uh, before you do that. But yeah, so that's why this file exists, even though it's empty. Um, and same with the value table. Again, it exists in the first simulation, the one we just did with the loop, uh, but not in this one. So now let's, let's actually look at some of these files um, here. The output summary is just uh, a sort of parsed uh, quantum espresso output, because this is what the raw output looks like. It's in the output log. This is the raw quantum espresso output it's, you know, if you don't know too much about quantum espresso, this is, you know, a little bit much. It might be much for a student to, to understand. Um, so we've sort of stripped some of it out. Um, so unless you're trying to teach your student how to use quantum espresso specifically, I would say you probably aren't going to be looking at this um, unless you're troubleshooting for yourself. Um, but yeah, the output summary, however, it has some values uh, such as um, and remember, this was our variable cell relaxation. Um, the initial atomic positions and the final atomic positions. Um, the stress, the final stress should be small because we've relaxed it. Um, we started with, uh, with this uh, cell parameters here. That's the FCC lattice using the 5.46 um, lattice constant. And this is the new one. Okay, and so it turns out for FCC, you can just double this value. Uh, so let's again do that live. 2.733976 times 2. Uh, yeah, and so we were close with 5.47 as our, as our guess, but it turns out for this set of approximations and for this particular pseudo potential, for this geometry, 5.4679 is a more accurate um uh more accurate uh lattice constant. So let's go ahead and change that to four four six seven nine five two. Um and so this is a, a nice study for, for students to do. It's just to to relax it and um and find what the ideal lattice constant is because that gets you to the, the bond length by doing some you know some stuff that you learn in introductory like materials physics. Um uh okay um so so yeah uh, after that we would do this not the young's modulus but the bulk modulus um as as was pointed out in the chat um using the the looping right and and so one thing uh this is for so so the next thing is we can look at these this density of states and band structure um to sort of answer that question uh, earlier 
And so now that we've got an accurate geometry, now we can do something like a density of states. You would want to use an accurate geometry. Otherwise, you're not getting the density of states of your system. You're getting it at, uh, the density of states under strain, which is a, you know an interesting study, but you better know what you're doing. Uh, that uh, what you're doing is what you mean to be doing. So all this stuff stays the same. Uh, looping is off. Uh, oh, you know, make sure that you've updated this value to whatever came out of your relaxation. Uh, and we can start. Uh, so he, here I've got a sort of comparison. Just came from from the literature somewhere. Uh, well, actually from from a Berkeley GW tutorial, which is a part of um, of what our, our group works on. Um, we're going to go back, let's see, calculation to SCF. Um, sorry, I missed that one part. Um, make sure looping's off, density of states, yes. Uh, let's set the number of bands to 12. Um, and let's compute the band structure as well. And, and we're going to leave this value at 8, um, but we're going to change the path through the, the K um, space. Okay, and so this will be the last thing we do here. So, um, so hang in there. Um, so yeah, so there's some default values here. And you can see L, X, um, and GG stands for gamma. These are the, path, the points, special points in, in the FCC um, in, in its reciprocal lattice. Um, and so the one up here seems to go through L, gamma, and then X, and then U, and then back to gamma. So we're going to do a few changes here. We get U, 40, and then change this to a gamma and 1. Okay. And what do these n numbers here mean? So, again, these L and X, um, uh, looking back at, at this... Uh, you know this resource here, which I think I've linked to in the in the page. Um, they refer to just the points, right? Like they tell you whether these points are are on the face of this reciprocal lattice uh, of this Brillouin zone or at a you know vertex or so on. Uh, and these are their uh, the coordinates here. Uh, the, uh, these are the coordinates actually in in. Uh, in K space, okay? The 4A refers to how many sort of intermediate points uh, we're going to interpolate through um, uh, and, and look for. Um, if you didn't, you know, maybe you don't have an FCC lattice, maybe you have something that's not symmetric, uh, not so symmetric anyways. Um, you might have to, you know, write these in by hand uh, as I've done here as well. So instead of doing this, you know, GG, UX, or whatever, uh, is you use the coordinates uh, and they're raw in units of uh, 2 pi by A. Uh, so for example, uh, let's see, L is pi over A, pi over A, pi over A. Uh, that's half of 2 pi by A. So it's 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5. And again, 40 is about the, the interpolating points. So uh, let's go ahead and simulate. And, and see what we get. Well, spoilers on the right. Um, OK, so we've got this X Chris Den stuff. It kind of, kind of built up on me. I should have turned off uh, X Chris Den. Um, oh, still simulating. OK. Um, yeah, well, that, while it's simulating, we have just a few minutes left. But let's look at some chat and Q&A. What's the difference between VASP and Espresso? I believe VASP costs money, <laughs> and Espresso does not. That's a that's a big difference. Um, can I come again to how I got to the details of the lattice constants? Ah, yes. Uh, so it looks like that was uh, from much earlier. Um, it's in the it's in the document uh, which I recommend downloading uh, in section four, uh, Roman numeral four. Uh, I went to the materials project and I logged in, oops, I, I signed in and I searched for silicon in the materials explorer. Um, and then uh, I went to, to the, the, the starred one, MP149, uh, uh, 
uh, symmetry of, of diamond silicon. And then I found the crystal structure. It's a 5.47. Uh, it's a it, it, the conventional lattice with with a 5.47 as the lattice constant. Okay, so it's done on the left. I will place it up as I answer some of these questions. There's a lot more output here uh, because I did two things at once. Um, oh, so here's the density of states plot. Um, if you wanted to draw data to sort of plot it externally, you can go to DOS data. As similar for bands, um, but yeah, we can compare that to to the. Uh, I don't know if uh, yeah, if we can see. Oops, so come back down. Yeah, so this is the comparison between the two. Uh, the bottom one on the bottom is is uh, from the literature. I believe it was a Hartree Fock method, maybe. Um. Yeah, so it's got a same overall shape here. Um, again, all this can be improved with more K points, um, more a higher, um, larger bands. Uh, sorry, higher uh, kinetic energy cutoff, uh, and so on. Um, it's got some of these sort of important features, um, which you might care about. Um, the more bands you calculate the higher it goes on this end of the plot. Uh, so it looks like they just sort of stopped calculating. Um, we can look also at the, the band structure uh, by going down to bands structure here. And it looks a little funny because it's so wide. Uh, and so we can just uh, scrunch it up <laughs> uh, to better compare it Oh, actually, I think you can do that here. Yeah, that's right. To better compare it to the to the reference um, down here. Um, uh, yeah, so you can see it's got some of these uh, features. It looks like maybe I mistyped one. So I don't see. Well, this this part <laughs> definitely looks good by the gamma point, but uh, is this? Yeah. Yeah, so there's some downsides too. Is um, zero isn't meaningful here. <laughs> like uh, you want it zero to be at the Fermi level, um, but uh, we haven't done any processing in order for that to to be the case, um, which is something we should change probably. Is to make zero be, for example, like the bottom of the valence band or something, or at least somewhere within the the band gap. Um, and yeah, you can. Uh, you can look here and try and uh, figure out, uh, have your students figure out what the band gap is or um, ask them, you know, if it's an indirect band, indirect or, or a direct band gap, et cetera. Um, yeah, so that's about uh, the last calculation I want to do. We can also uh, just take a quick peek at the document um, for the phone on stuff. Um, there's a little bit more instructions. Um, I know a lot of people are interested in, in you know, doing Raman spectra, for example. Um, and we can do that here. It is much more costly. It, it takes a lot longer. Even um, with just a few atoms, like three or five, um, it might take long. I think in the version that I put up, I might have put a MOS2 up here, uh, and that was a mistake, and so it should say silicon, but... But yeah, here we can actually visualize uh, the phonon modes, and actually I've done I've done so already, and just to show you what that's like, um, uh, you can go into Xcristen and tell it to display forces. They're not really forces; they're the phonon modes. Um, but that's just how we tricked uh, Espresso. I mean, sorry, Xcristen. Um, you can see that these are going in the same direction. So these are the three um, acoustic modes. And then if we go higher, we can see that one of the atoms is in the other direction, so that's an optical mode. Um, and so it does compute them, it just takes a little while. Um, so great, so I think I'll just answer questions for now. Um, thank you all um, for, for listening. I really hope you guys give this, uh, give this guy a shot in your classroom, um, whether you're teaching materials physics uh, or maybe sort of introductory DFT. Um, uh, yeah, I, I want to thank uh, the people here at NanoHub as I answer some of these questions. Um, yeah, thanks for that great presentation, Dr. Guerrero. So, 
Uh, one question was about uh, the version of Espresso. So this is actually using an old version, Espresso 6.1. Um, I don't know how to update it <laughs> personally. Um, so I'll, I'll ask uh, someone else um, uh, if we if we sh if we should update it or if it's sort of well would break everything <laughs> to update Espresso. I know there's other tools that do use Espresso. There's at least one other one that I've seen. Um, and I, I believe we would both have to change our toolkits, um, uh, or, or maybe not. Uh, is the Fermi level already aligned? Uh, no, it is not. You have to do that yourself, I guess. Um, that's something that I think uh, it would be on a so it should be on a to do list. Sorry, right now. Uh, no options for spin orbit coupling. Um, that's correct in the toolkit there are no options well i think <laughs> how can we find direct and indirect band gap from band structure um so let's stick up oh, i'm in the wrong one that's why okay yeah so the fact that uh, the lowest point in the in the conduction band um is not directly above the highest point in the valence band. You know, the, if the lowest point in the in the conduction band would be up here, then that would be direct. But but as since it's off to the side here, it's indirect. Um, carry out TDFT. Um, no, no. I I think I've not worked with TDFT in in Espresso, uh, and this this module certainly does not do. Uh, time de time dependent density functional theory. Uh, which college and major are you from? So I I um, oh yeah I guess I didn't mention that at the very beginning is uh, it's at the bottom of my PowerPoint. Uh, um, I just very recently graduated uh, with my PhD from from uh, the University of California Merced. Um, yeah. Uh, to get the real band gap. How many basis sets, uh, numbers, or K cells should we use? Um, well, so take a look at the number used in the density of states, 16 by 16 by 16. Um, I think, if I recall, you can just increase this number. It uses, so it interpolates based on, um, you know, it, it must interpolate based on this one here. So probably if you set this higher, uh, we would get a better, a, a more accurate interpolation of the uh, of the band structure. Something like uh, I don't know, you know, sixteen by sixteen is not abnormal for for you know a DOS uh, or band structure interpolation. But the wave function, the kinetic energy cutoff, probably could be higher as well. What is a reasonable band gap error? So um, that's just sort of uh, if. Quite a fundamental question in, in DFT. Um, density functional theory is a ground state theory, um, which which means it's accurate for uh, for the ground state, um, and it's we can make guesses, um, reasonable guesses for for the excited states um, and the in between, right? So um, between between uh, the excited state and the ground state, that energy difference, uh, that band gap. Um, it, we, we make good guesses with DFT, uh, but they are improved by other methods such as GW, which is shown somewhere in this uh, in this paper right here. Yeah, so so you see here, GW is a more advanced version. Uh, it's a more advanced computation than, than DFT. Um, and you can see that this blue line here is uh, is higher up. Um, it's it's more accurate. Uh, so th the difference you see here is, you know, it could be the the sort of accuracy difference between DFT and the real world. Uh, the problem is that sometimes um, do you see how this green line is lower than the blue line? Sometimes the green line goes underneath the valence band, and uh, the sorry, the valence band maximum, and so then you have just a completely wrong result in, in that a, a, an insulator um, looks like you know a metal or something. 
Are there known issues with X Kristen? The labels in the brown tabs were absent and no image appeared. And this person's running Chrome on Mac OS. Um any known issues with X uh try resizing it. <laughs> uh resizing the toolkit sometimes fixes it. Uh, if you email me a, a screenshot, I, I can maybe help you a little bit more directly. Um, but yeah, sometimes there's some weird, weird things happen with with the uh, like stuff disappearing. Eguero23 at ucmerced.edu. Are there information cards available for standard semiconductors like GAs and INP? Um, yeah, so. The, this so this seminar here is kind of maybe uh, this one and the one from from uh, two weeks ago uh, is is maybe our first real like attempt at at getting our toolkit uh, sort of out there in in um, in a more formal way. So as of right now, this guide here is is pretty much the only thing I've got for for espresso. However, um, one thing that I didn't mention is you can obviously go to you know Quantum Espresso tutorial uh and it sounded like you were talking about um gallium nitride maybe uh, let's see maybe they have one uh and so okay so that doesn't look like a tutorial but uh, but certainly there are tutorials um and then you know people have done some of these standard materials um uh uh yeah so here here's i think one yeah there's a lot of tutorials on espresso you can sort of try and like um combine it with our module uh if if you're not using um uh just raw espresso by itself um and another place which i've mentioned in the in the worksheet is that if you wanted to know you know what's exactly happening um i've given this uh so there's this uh let's see run parameters okay so run parameters is the raw like set of variables that was used in the computation um but also there's this input file which is going into espresso you can look up pw.x input this is the the uh, um you know documentation for espresso and you can match up you know what does you know nat mean um nat is the number of atoms and so there's two atoms for example in our cell um that would be the the hard and long like i'm gonna slug through this uh the hard way uh would be looking through the quantum espresso documentation to understand what's the toolkit doing based on your input all right, yeah. great. Thanks again, Dr. Greer. So thanks everyone for attending and have a great day.